when I spoke to Dorothea Brombe, who's here, there she is, uh, talking about uh, what authors will be publishing new books um, right before the festival, we heard that Anne Enright was going to uh, publish this book, The Green Way, or Den Gröna Vägen. And we immediately thought that we really want Anne to come to Sigtuna Literature Festival. Many of us have read The Gathering, a great book, which you deservingly got the Booker Prize. Congratulations. Uh, now, uh, when we've had you here for two days already, we know that you're not just a wonderful and great author, you're also a wonderful person. And it's been great to have you here. Sincere, it's fun to have you here, Ad. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so it's great to welcome you here. And uh, we're also welcoming Madeleine Levy, who is the literary editor of Svenska Dagbladet. And uh, we welcome you especially. You have a master in modern literature from Oxford and University and very many other things on your list, of course, but that's one of them. And when we asked you if you wanted to come here and talk to Anne and Wright, you said immediately, yes, I do. Yes. And we're so happy to have the both of you here and that you will talk about this really, really good book. Uh, and haven't you read it already? I know that you're going to go out and buy it and read it afterwards. So, um, very welcome. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, when you recently announced the first ever fiction laureate for Ireland, the chair of the jury said something that, like that for 25 years you've been helping the Irish make sense of their lives and you've been helping the rest of the world make sense of the Irish. Mm. Um, is that deliberate? Uh, well, I write in Ireland. I write in an Irish accent. I write in the Irish tradition, I suppose. Um, but I, I write more from Ireland than about Ireland. I think if you start writing about things, then the subject is going to die, or the fiction, the story is going to die. I mean, a story comes from a place, but if you start aiming the story, you know, then it's, it's going to somehow end up wrong. So, uh, Ireland is the very fertile ground where I sow the seeds of my fictions and it's a very good place to write from. It is uh, a really nourishing, uh, astonishing tradition. Um, it's also overwhelmingly a male tradition. So, I, you know, have been for years sticking my elbows out and asking why these female voices are unhearable in the Irish tradition. And that also has informed my work and set up a series of tensions and contradictions that I work between, you know. So it's, Ireland is a great place to be a writer. I mean, it's a horrible place to be a writer. That's what <laughs> makes it so good. There's nothing complacent about it, you know. Which can also be said for The Green Road, which is a place and which is the title of your latest book. Could you tell us a little bit more about, well, the Green Road, what, what is uh, it? Yeah, I mean, when I started this book, um, th this, um, I had in my mind a kind of geography, a kind of relationship to landscapes, both in Ireland and elsewhere. I needed my characters to go places. So it's about people leaving and coming home. So they have various landscapes, but the landscape they start from is the iconic La landscape of the west of Ireland and and the landscape in the west of Ireland holds all the sorrows of the Irish people okay <laughs> this is beautiful land it is poor land and it was made I suppose uh, the people there were made heroic in the late 19th century by WB Yeats and John Millington Singh and that new sense of heroism and nobility and beauty 
informed the beginning of the Irish state. So I was on holidays, a long holiday. We took a long rent on a house in just by the Green Road, and I was looking out over the Aran Islands, which uh, is the westernmost part of Ireland, where John Millington Singh had set the playboy of the Western world. And I went on my walk every day, and I thought, this is this is. This is the re this is the soil. This is the this is the place, and I have never written about it, and I've always been afraid of writing about it because an immense amount of fraudulent writing comes from a mythic or sentimental view of that poverty and what came from it, um, and then I just realised I couldn't avoid writing about it. That you know the sky existed, the earth was under my feet. I owned it as much as anyone else. My Father came from a small farm 30 miles down the coast. And I've always been not a rural writer, not what you associate perhaps with the Irish tradition in some ways, you know, hedgerows and cows and rain and whiskey and horrible sexual secrets and uh, priests and <laughs> mm -hmm. lo lovely, lovely, lovely girls, lovely women. <laughs> yeah, you, you've actually... So I never wrote all of that, you know, and, 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 and why not, you know? My, I, I, if one can in any way possess a place, it is as much in my genetic makeup as, as it is in, in many of the writers you can think about who write all that. So mm -hmm. for me, the book was a return. It was a return to my father's landscape and to the place where I used to go on holidays when I was a child. I think you've said or you've written that there's a cliche about this area that people are, as you say, lovely. Yes. Whereas the people that you write about, I think, again, in your words, they're more often than not odd or unhappy. Yeah, well, they're um, lovely or they're miserable. You know, when money came into Ireland at the beginning of the 20th, in the noughties, we were very worried that the soul of Ireland would be lost. Because, of course, we were lovely because we were poor. I thought we could be lovely and rich. Yeah. I thought that would be fair. <laughs> you know, why do we have to suffer? Will it make our manners terrible? Will we our, our welcome less open? Anyway, um, what was the question? Just, what was the question, Madeline? <laughs> what Thank was the way. question? Um, uh, uh, just the contrast between the two. I'll take the next oh, one. Oh, yeah, I no, I mean, I, I, I write for whatever I see. Um, and that's that people are mostly odd or unhappy? I don't know if they're odd. They're complex. I like to, I like to, I like to dig in, you know. I like to give a bit of complexity. Yeah. Um, it is, as you mentioned, a place connected to a lyrical tradition. Yes. Uh, there's a poem by um, Emily Lawless in your book, which is very central in the book. I don't know if you'd like to quote a little bit from it. Or well, you know, I said to my father, we were going down this a town on the west of Ireland called La Hinch, which is great surfing. And my husband's midlife crisis happened on a surfboard. He, that, that was the place he, he, it could have been a Maserati and a girl, but no, it was a surfboard, which was great. And we, we were going down to this place. My father, um, he, he, he was very, uh, his voice wasn't great. He had difficulties with his voice. So he heard where I was going and he said, um, Oh, little Kirkabaskin, the wild, the bleak, the fair. Oh, little stony pastures whose flowers are sweet, if rare. Oh, rough the rude Atlantic, the thunderous, the wide, whose kiss is like a soldier's kiss that will not be denied. Ah, uh, now I can't remember the last. Uh, All night long we dream of you, and waking, think we are there, vain dream and foolish waking, we never shall see Clare. So Clare was where he was born and where he was reared, but also he has all, had all this poetry, uh, sort of not bad poetry, 19th century, nationalistic, lyrical poetry, uh, none of it classic, but he had a huge number of these poems in his head. So I listened to him and I said, well, I have to write a book now. <laughs> yes. So will you please? I, but I, then, you know, you. I had to take all these, these various, um, this, this very uh, lovely relationship to language and, uh, and deal with it myself somehow. So this is Hannah, who's 11, 12 in the first chapter, and she's 
going to the little farm where her grandmother um, lives with her father. And the idea of the Celtic twilight, I don't know if you know about the Celtic twilight, W.B. Yeats and Lady Gregory went into this landscape. They were looking for fairies. That's, and they found lots of fairies and ghosts and all the rest of it. And they had this, uh, and they called it the Celtic twilight. But so I, the idea of twilight, of dusk, of the light fading is very central to the book. So the next day, which was Holy Thursday, he, his, her father, brought Hannah out in the new orange cortina with the door that gave a great crack when you opened it. A few miles out, he started to hum and you could feel the sky getting whiter as they traveled towards the sea. Hannah loved the little house at Boulevard, four rooms, a porch full of geraniums, a mountain out the back and out the front, a sky full of weather. If you crossed the long meadow, you came to a boreen which brought you up over a small rise to a view of the Aran Islands out in Galway Bay and the cliffs of Moher, which were also famous far away to the south. This road turned into the green road that went across the Burren, high above the beach at Fenor, and this was the most beautiful road in the world. Bar none, her granny said, famed in song and story, the rocks gathering briefly into walls before lapsing back into field, the little stony pastures whose flowers were sweet and rare. And if you lifted your eyes from the difficulties of the path, it was always different again. The islands sleeping out in the bay, the clouds running their shadows across the water, the Atlantic surging up the distant cliffs in a tranced, silent plume of spray. Far below were the limestone flats they called the flaggy shore. Grey rocks under a grey sky and there were days when the sea was a glittering grey and your eyes could not tell if it was dusk or dawn. Your eyes were always adjusting. It was like the rocks took the light and hid it away. And that was the thing about Boulevard. It was a place that made itself hard to see. And Hannah loved her granny Madigan, a woman who looked like she had a lot to say and wasn't saying any of it. In the green road, there's the road. There's also there's road. a house that means a lot, which is really the pivot of the um, narration, so to say. And you've, I think you've said as well that you like leaning on kitchen counters. A lot of what you write kind of takes place in houses that are very important. In yes. the gathering, you had a family of uh, nine siblings gathering in a house. Even a corpse being brought into the house, making that very central. And here, we have a house and an elderly woman, Rosaline, um, who's about to sell the house. Uh, oh, she says she's going to sell it, but Rosaline just says things. <laughs> okay. She just says it to annoy her children. She's so annoyed with them. She's going to just sell the house and let them sort themselves out. She's going to give them the money if that's what they want. And, and none of them have any money. She doesn't know why they've no money. She suppose that's her fault too. So that's the kind of style of woman Rosaline is. She comes from a kind um, she thinks she comes from important people. In fact, I mean, she does. She's, uh, she comes from the town. That house that I've just described in Boulevard is a little country cottage. She comes from the town. Rosaline's father was the chemist, which was a very important um, person to be in the town. And she married f for love and for desire. She married Pat Madigan from Boulevard and considers e e e to the end of her life that she married beneath her. Um, but uh, she has a house which is a very a different style of house. It's on the outskirts of this small town. Um, and it has, I can tell you how many bedrooms it has if you're interested. Or, but anyway, <laughs> but in, in 2005, the house is, is difficult for her. her. Her brain, I think, isn't what it used to be. And she decides she's going to, um, to that it's too much for her. It is too much for her. Um, what she doesn't say is that she's going to move in with her daughter. She doesn't tell her daughter this. <laughs> she says, I'm selling the house, I'm moving in with you. Um, so her, but that house, um, 
is it different in the gathering? There's this, there are these tiny differences in class. Ireland thinks of itself as a classless society, but of course we have huge, minuscule, gigantic at the same time differences in in class well, between one and the other. So this is a, a well-founded, well-got house that Rosaline has, and I'm very interested in these interior spaces. Uh, at, at one stage, I am. Um, well, the day is long when you're writing, so I, I did the interior decoration on the house. Well, they're coming back. The children are coming back in 2005, and they're looking at wallpaper that they slept beside when they were children. Or they're looking at wallpaper patterns are, 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 are really interesting to small children and repetition of patterns. And the kind of madness of wallpaper is, I always find it kind of funny. But they, they have bamboo, do you know that bamboo wallpaper from the 1970s? That's in the dining room, so when they come back, it's, it's lifting a little in the corner and there's some black, black things, going, a little bit of wet going up the wall. But it's the same wallpaper, the same dishes, although the dishes get broken, and these, to themselves, very different people. So they have their child's eye, they have their child's unfed soul, and the hungriness of the child, um, and they have uh, their adult bodies surrounding all of that. So they look at each other and they look at the house. Um, and at one, time, at one stage in the book, Rosaline remembers all the different layers, these tiny layers, the wallpaper in the kitchen, it used to be yellow, yellow flowers in the 60s. And then in the 70s, she painted a terracotta, you know. <laughs> Did we all do that? I don't know. And now it's a kind of off-white, very Scandi, off-white, Scandinavian style. So that idea of real estate is there in the end of the gathering, which is set in 2002, where Veronica realizes that the small home where all her difficulties began, her grandmother's house, she could just buy one. And she could just clean it out and history would be over. She would put oak floors down, she would sell it. She would turn her grief into, uh, turn her utter hurt into the satisfaction of money. She would triumph over it by, by, by buying and selling houses. Um, and the Irish uh, mania for real estate that uh, is, is something to do with that sense of hurt. But here they have to translate another type of grief into cash. They have to translate mother's love or the absence of mother's love into cash. And it doesn't really make sense to them. I mean, how could it make sense? Um. When uh, Rosalind feels, well, a little bit sorry for herself, she also thinks about how none of her children are anything like her. And also the four children are very different. This is yes. something that in life I'm always fascinated by, how siblings can be so different to each other, how people within a family can be so tight-knit and yet have such different characteristics and go through life in such different ways. Is this something that you think about as well? Hugely. I mean, if you have, if you have more than one baby, you know, the baby comes out and looks at you and, and there they are, okay? And you think all babies are like that. <laughs> then you have another baby <laughs> and the baby turns and looks at you and it's someone completely different. It's amazing just in those first minutes how, how present they are. Um, Rosaline is, I, I don't mean to be too hard on Rosaline, I think she's a wonderful, wonderful person. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I don't know. She's a terrible mother in, in very small ways because <laughs> she has favorites among her children, which is, uh, uh, as we know, a wrong thing. Um, but she also assigns them roles in her own inner drama. She's not a woman who knows herself very well. So the eldest boy is wonderful, can do no wrong. The second boy is the one who isn't really on, who judges her a little, she feels judged by him. The eldest girl is the one who is going to look after her in her old age, and that is exactly what happens. And the youngest girl is just endlessly problematic. If there's a problem, it's going to be because Hannah is, has lost her keys, or you know, she's endlessly in the wrong. Um, and so, as with all kind of labels, 
well, these are the first ones we are assigned, but we are, we're always trying to get out of the box that, other, that life puts us in or that other people put us in. It's particularly hard for the children to get out of the box that their mother puts them in. Um, but they are all really quite different. Yes, yeah. they do this in different ways. There's Dan, for example, the oldest. The yeah. He, well, first he decides to go into priesthood, which we'll hear a little bit more mm -hmm. about, but then he ends up somewhere completely different. Yes. Um, they, all le they all, except for Constance, leave their mother, leave their country, some of them, um, in the first half of the book. And each of them gets a full sort of little book of their own, a section of their own. I have a kind of... Um, I, I, I have long and complex theories about authority, which I won't bore you with. <laughs> but I, 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 because I don't want to claim authority or a false authority in my books, I like it to be as democratic as possible. So I like that each of the siblings should get their own say. And because they have a different style, they each have a, a different spirituality, a different sexual style, they have because they're very much themselves and they see the world differently, they each get a very different narrative. Yes, they, yeah, yeah we follow them into very different situations yes. as well. The book travels um, to New York, to, to Africa. Africa, to Dublin. Yes. And to Constance's more kind of her life. She's the one who didn't get away. So the one who say. didn't get away, yeah. She's stuck with the chores and taking care of her mother. Yes, she's, she washes a lot of dishes. Yes. When we first meet them, though, in the very first chapter. We're in 1980, yes. but as far as I think an outside reader is concerned, it could almost be 1880. Well, to me, I, I say 1950, which is probably the same as 1880. It could be 1950, it could be 1930. The, the, I remember 1980, the first thing I did when I knew what year it was is I went to the National Library and I took out the television guide and check the days in, in Holy Week, the week going up to Easter, to see what programs were on, to, to, be, to be really super precise about what it was all about. But those days were so different, the days of my childhood. In 1980, the Pope came to Ireland. Everyone was briefly, ecstatically and wonderfully Catholic. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's only 25 years between this section and the second part of the book, mm -hmm. um, but yes, it feels very remote, very yes, different. Yes. There's even, I mean, in the relationship to the children, Emmett gets hit on the fingers with a ruler, Yes. Uh, which at least for me feels like something that wouldn't happen in 1980. I don't know when uh, people stopped hitting in other people in Ireland or hitting children. I think it probably happened in 1972. <laughs> yeah. It's for Something some, like I think for a Swedish reader, it part, it's part of what makes Ireland quite exotic. Mm. The fact that it, well, that the 1980s were still like very much like the 1950s. Yeah, and Irish writers are often accused or or loved for uh, writing about the past, but the past is very much there. I mean, it's not so long ago the past in Ireland. <laughs> Let's hear a little bit more about. So what this is Dan, is the eldest uh, guy, and he's decided he's going to become a priest, which already in 1980 was a bit silly. There were only three new priests in Dublin in 1980. So he made the big announcement at Sunday dinner, which the Madigans always did with a tablecloth and proper napkins, no matter what. On that Sunday, which was Palm Sunday, this is Hannah's eyes. She's 12. Okay. They had bacon and cabbage with white sauce and carrots, green, white, and orange, like the Irish flag. There, were, there was a little glass of parsley sitting on the tablecloth, and the shadow of the water trembled in the sunshine. Their father folded his large hands and said grace, after which there was silence, apart from the general sound of chewing, that is, and their father clearing his throat, as he tended to do every minute or so. <coughs> The parents sat at either end of the table, the children along the sides, girls facing the window, boys facing the room, Constance and Hannah, Emmett and Dan. There was a fire in the grate and the sun also shone now and then, so they were warm as winter and warm as summer for five minutes at a time. They were twice as warm. Dan said, I have been speaking again with Father Fall. It was April. 
a dappled kind of day. The clean light caught the drops on the window pane in all their multiplicity, while outside a thousand baby leaves unfurled against branches black with rain. Inside, their mother had a tissue trapped in the palm of her hand. She lifted against it against her forehead. Oh no, she said, turning away, and her mouth sagged open so you could see the carrots. He says, I must ask you to think again that it is hard for a man who does not have his family behind him. It is a big decision I'm making. And he says, I must ask you, I must plead with you not to spoil it with your own feelings and concerns. Dan spoke as though they were in private. Or he spoke as though they were in a great hall, but it was a family meal which was not the same as either of these things. You could see their mother had an impulse to rise from the table, but could not allow herself to flee. He says I am to ask your forgiveness for the life you'd hoped for me and the grandchildren you will not have. Emmett snorted into his dinner. Dan pressed his hands down on the table before swiping at his little brother fast and hard. Their mother blanked for the blow like a horse jumping a ditch. But Emmett ducked, and after a long second, she landed on the other side. She put her head down as though to gather speed. A moan came out of her, small and unformed. The sound of it seemed to please as well as surprise her. So she tried again. This next moan started soft and went long, and there was a kind of speaking to its last rise and fall. Oh, God, she said. She threw her head back and blinked at the ceiling once, twice. Oh, dear God. The tears started to run, one on top of the last, down to her hairline. One, two, three, four. She stayed like that for a moment while the children watched and pretended not to be watching, and her husband cleared his throat into the silence. <clears throat> Their mother lifted her hands and shook them free of her sleeves. She wiped her wet temples with the heels of her hands and used her delicate, crooked fingers to fix the back of her hair, which she always wore in a chignon. Then she sat up again, and looked very carefully at nothing. She picked up a fork and stuck it into a piece of bacon, and she brought it to her mouth, but the touch of the meat to her tongue undid her. The fork swung back down towards her plate, and the bacon fell. Her lips made that wailing shape, touching in the middle and open at the sides, what Dan called her wide mouth frog look. Then she took a sharp inhale and read, ah! <gasps> it seemed to Hannah her mother might stop eating or if she was that hungry she might take her plate and go into another room in order to cry but this did not occur to her mother clearly and she sat there eating and crying at the same time much crying little eating there was more work with the tissue which was now in shreds it was awful the pain was awful. Her mother juddering and sputtering with the carrots falling from her mouth in little lumps and piles. Constance, who is the eldest, bossed them all quietly about and they carried plates and cups past their mother as she dripped one way or another into her own food. Oh, mammy, said Constance, leaning in with her arm about her to slip the plate neatly away. Dan was the eldest boy, so it was his job to cut the apple tart, which he stood to do dark against the window light with the silver triangle of the cake slice in his hand. You can count me out, said their father, who had been playing in a tiny way with the handle of his teacup. He got up and left the room and Dan said, five, so how am I going to do five? There were six Madigans. Five was a whole new angle as he moved the cake slice through the ghost of a cross and then swung it 18 degrees to the side. It was a prizing open of the relations between them. It was a different story altogether, as though there might be any number of Madigans and out in the wide world, any number of apple tarts. Their mother's crying turned to funny staggered inhalations. <laughs> 
as she dug into her dessert with a small spoon. And the children too were comforted by the pastry and by the woody sweetness of the old apples. Still, there was no ice cream on offer that Sunday and none of them asked for it, though they all knew there was some. It was jammed into the ice box at the top right hand corner of the fridge. Thank you. Well, after hearing that, I think I have to quote one of your colleagues, A.L. Kennedy, who oh, yes. said about your voice, that it's your writing voice, that is, that it's muscular and agile, sometimes witty, sometimes hallucinogenic, often dark and lyrical in a quiet and horribly skillful way. Um, and I couldn't agree more. Would you agree? Well, that's very nice of her to say so. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. And how um, on earth do you get there? How does somebody write like this? How? Well, I spend all my life <laughs> <laughs> learning how, how to, to, or getting to the end of the next sentence. And um, I suppose, uh, people are very interested in writing because this is the state, when you're really writing, you don't know what you're doing. You're in a state of flow. So, I mean, um, muscular. I mean, a, a, a Alison Kennedy has a very long line you know, in a, a long sentence. I, I get very interested in the cadences of, of the work. And I like to use semicolons a lot, <laughs> not, to, not to be so technical, but uh, I, I like the sentence to be surprising at the end. I use a lot of qualifications. I use very, I wish I could use more, uh, but you know, the grass is, the, the, the grass is, I mean, I, I use very, I like to be precise, which means being simple, but um, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I don't, I don't, I can't, I can't, I can't wash all the meaning out of my words, you know, they, they, I, I like the fact that they contain quite a lot of meaning and resonances, you know, some people aim for a very simple, unresonant prose, but mine is very, f very full of resonances for me as well, uh, you know. It is often witty and quite funny and um, sometimes often quite harsh on your characters, but with a great loyalty and love for them in all their faults. Well, that's I a lovely say. word, yeah. I mean, I think if you're talking about, you know, wit or whatever, I'm also quite astonished by writers who have no jokes in their books because life is full of jokes. So how do you get rid of them all? And why would you get rid of them all? That, that to me is a bigger question. People say, well, why is your work funny? But I mean, how, how can, how can uh, but life, you know, you, you, how can you write unfunny books? That must take a huge effort. <laughs> you know, that, that, a bigger effort, really. But loyalty is a wonderful uh, work. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, uh, I have my characters in, I, in my care, you know. And, I, I, you know, when I think of them as I think of friends and relations, you know, I think about their lives and their problems. Sometimes with friends and relations, you can see things in their lives that they can't. Um, and that is also partly the relationship I have to the characters, that I know more about them. Sometimes you wait for them to realize things that you know about them already. And you hope that they get there. Is yeah. there special care for the women and for the circumstances that their lives have imposed on them? Well, I, this is the first time I've really written men. And I, I wrote, I have always written female characters, not for any reason, except it, it never occurred to me to write men. Uh, I mean, the female characters to me stood for everything. I, I didn't, they didn't seem to be terribly gender specific, but they, they did because they often, in the old days used to lead smaller lives, then it was, um, I, I, I like to write my characters out of traps, out of small spaces. It, just the, the force or the energy of the prose is an escape in some way. And so the small lives of the characters of women 
were very suited to this. So here I was, I was writing men, and they were going everywhere, and they went away from their mother. I mean, in the way men do, they didn't ring her every week or anything, and, and they didn't think about her either. They, they turned a different way. So I thought that was true enough to the, to the men I, I, I know. But the, the women, the Hannah and Constance, have a much more complex uh, separating thing. Constance doesn't separate, and Hannah is, has a great difficulty making the separation. Um, and although my female characters in the past have often, in some tiny way, triumphed, and I really wanted these female characters to escape in some way, but they, they don't have a great time in the book. No. I couldn't write them into a wonderful new life. It just didn't, it just wasn't the right way to go. They make accommodations. Constance in particular, she's the one who looks after everyone. And she is the most contented of the Madigans. Um, but she's always, she's always yearns for, she, she always chides herself for her ingratitude. She always says, I have a lovely life, but I have a lovely life, but I have a lovely life. She's washing dishes all day on Christmas day, all day. Everyone gets up from the table and pretends to help. And then they go, oh, they've done the dishes. And Constance goes and washes the dishes all day and says, but I have a lovely life. And her son comes and stands beside her. And her son is so beautiful. And he asks her for money. <laughs> but her son, there he is. He's, he's gorgeous. And, and she gets great satisfaction in her relationships. Um, and because her expectations are deliberately and constantly low, she, um, she doesn't share the dissatisfaction that the family seems to have. Is there a great difference in how children and having children um, was perceived, well, in a generation before yours and yours? I think about both Rosaline and her relationship to her children, but also, of course, the mother in The Gathering who can't even remember, I mean, she has so many children, she can't remember their names. She doesn't know who's who. And then I read yeah. about your relationship in making babies with your children and it's incredibly close mm. and you study every minute detail of their lives and you do everything you can to understand them. And I'm wondering, do you think that's personal or is that generational? Do we look at children in a different way? I really nowadays? think we do, you know, I really think we do. Um, children were powerless, and in a country where power was not, much of it was available, they were, they, they were very not well treated, I think, in Ireland, um, because they were, uh, uh, and we used to laugh growing up at Americans and how, 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 how astonishingly selfish they were, and how they didn't want this and they wanted that. I mean, they, wa yeah, what? I remember, I was just saying to someone else yesterday, I had my, my grandmother, um, in, in my grandmother's generation, you could choose a child you liked, and then you could say you didn't like the other one. You say, I don't like the look of that one now. <laughs> and my, my, my father's mother didn't like me. This was well known or known. And she didn't like me for the simple reason that I looked like her. And I also had the same name. So this was known. She didn't like me because I looked like her. And that seemed, nobody questioned that and said, what a foolish old woman, would she ever shut up? <laughs> my other grandmother didn't like my sister because she kicked her when she was two. Or maybe younger than two. They had a nap together and the child kicked her. And, and so that, no, not that child. That child has a bad attitude. This is the, you know, this is the one who's going to get the chocolate. Um, so by my parents' generation, of course, that was, that was no longer the case. And they knew that, <laughs> that you don't do that anymore. Um, and so that left the, the, but there's still kind of tiny remnants of it. And now we look at children and we love them all and we give them a chance. Sometimes I have a tiny feeling about a child that I don't share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
let's keep quiet about that I'll one. keep quiet about that. We don't have much time left. Um, I wanted to return to where we start and actually ask you about this. The Irish laureate for fiction. Ireland is known for supporting its artists in many ways. And I think this, I, I don't know if any other country has got the laureate for fiction. What is it? What, what's your, what do you do? Um, the laureate for, uh, uh, Ireland is a very informal culture um, and doesn't have many honours and um, is, you know, even the most elevated in other cultures, the most elevator, elevated writers are not considered above anyone else. I remember I was with Seamus Heaney in a pub once. This is, I'll tell you about the laureate in a minute. But I was with Seamus Heaney, the Nobel Prize winner, and we were talking in a pub, and a man came up and said, excuse me. And Seamus thought he wanted to go to the toilets behind him. He said, oh, I'm sorry. He thought he was in the way. And then he said, no, you're Seamus Heaney. And he said, yes, 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 I am, yeah, yeah, that's true. And, 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 and in a completely Irish moment, the man said, you taught my sister, Imelda Costello or whatever. He said, oh, Imelda, how is she? And that was, that, that was the great poet, okay. <laughs> that was, that, anyway, Ireland is a very informal culture and we don't have an academy and we don't, but the, um, the new post of the laureate is a symbolic, emblematic role, and it crystallizes I th what a number of Irish writers have been doing all, all over the world. And the books go everywhere, the writers follow the books, they represent the country, both abroad and to the uh, p people at home. So um, the laureate is, uh, it's just an honor and a job, something we have to do some teaching as well, um, and it's, given to a new writer every three years. So it's just a little formalizing of, of that very energetic writing culture. You mentioned that there, um, it's a male tradition, the literary tradition in Ireland. There has been lately, and I know that you've mentioned in other contexts, a few female writers that uh, are partly transforming that tradition. Would you, would you like to recommend any, apart from your own works? What, what should we read? Because I don't know, I don't know a lot of them and I don't know if the audience knows a lot of them. What, what would you recommend if you're um, interested? There's a book coming interested? out this week by a woman called Emer McBride and uh, she wrote a short book called A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing. Um, there are many uh, references to Joyce in the uh, journalists talk about Joyce when they talk about Emer McBride. It's high modernist, it's a very, very uh, you wouldn't call it fragmented or broken. It's not English as it is normally spoken, put it that way. Uh, it's, uh, she has a language all of her own. Um, uh, Sarah Bohm wrote a lovely uh, short book with a dog in it. That's really nice. Um, Lisa McInerney just won the Bailey's, the Women's Prize for Fiction with the Glorious Heresies, which I haven't read yet. Um, but there, there just is a general atmosphere of... of, of bad-minded fun among the, the younger women now. The new kind of confidence there. Well, thanks so much for that. Um, I can really deeply, thoroughly recommend The Green Road. And thanks for those other recommendations for, and for a lovely conversation. Thank thanks you. So Thank you, Madeleine. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.